Hello, uh, this is Johnny Henson, Professor Poole. I'm going to be teaching free seminars at uh, different HOA and uh, pool halls throughout the Phoenix area. If you're somebody that's planning on coming to one of my seminars, then I would appreciate it if you would watch this video in its entirety before coming to class. Um, uh, a lot of my students really wish that we could get through a lot of the book knowledge a little quicker and that way we can spend more time at the table me actually helping you correct some of the things that you're doing wrong. When you finish these two seminars you will have more instruction than 97% of the players that play pool. Uh, only 3% of all the players that play pool ever have any type of formal lesson by a professional billiard instructor. And so I look forward to seeing you in class. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about table sizes. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe uh, played when they were younger at the bars. Uh, those are usually three and a half by sevens. Um, and then uh, there's a table a little larger than that called a four by eight. And then there's a table larger than that, which is a four and a half by nine. Uh, so the way I would like for you to think of tables is, uh, you know, a three and a half by seven would be a more of a bar size table. Uh, a four by eight will be uh, technically a regulation. And then uh, a four and a half by nine is more of the modern regulation table. And so uh, different table sizes means they play a little different. <laughs> but uh, the basic uh, plan of the game will remain the same. Right now, I'd like to teach you a little bit about ball and hand rules. Uh, ball, uh, ball and hand rules are gonna be a little different than maybe the bar rules that you used to play with when you were growing up, okay? Uh, those used to be straight ain't no slop, many, and there's many terms for that, but those are not the real rule of, you know, of the game of pool, okay? One thing I would like for you to, to, to know when, when we're uh, when in ball in hand is everything has to do with after your, ma your cue ball makes contact with an object ball, okay? So let's say I hit the six, but nothing goes to a rail afterwards or goes in the pocket. That would be a foul, and it would be ball in hand anywhere on the table. Not, not in the kitchen, but anywhere on the table, okay? Now let's say I hit the six, and that my, uh, my cue ball goes to a rail, okay? Or the, or the object ball goes to a rail. Uh, or for, for, for the matter, let's say I'm, I'm shooting the six. Let's say I'm shooting the six. And, and uh, after I hit my six, uh, uh, one of my opponent's balls goes to a rail. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is after you make contact with, let's say you have the six, after you make contact with the six, does any ball on the table go to a rail? That could be your cue ball, could be your ball, could be your opponent's ball. Any ball on the table goes to a rail, it's a legal shot after make contact. Uh, or it goes in the pocket. If you make a ball in the pocket, that's considered taking a ball to a rail, okay? Now, the, the, now let's say you fail to do that. Let's say you hit the six and nothing goes to a rail, nothing's pocketed then it's ball in hand anywhere on the table. Your opponent can put this ball anywhere on the table that they wish, okay? So that's the gist of ball in hand. Uh, I know it's gonna be a little different. It's gonna be a little hard for a lot of you to understand uh, early on, but as you go forward with this game, you're gonna find that most people play ball in hand rules. And so what we need to do is start learning those rules and getting used to them so that we can have fun with the game. Now, uh, an, uh, part of ball and hand rules is, is a lot of people want to know where the location of a ball is. Wherever the ball is actually resting on the table, you know, like where it's actually touching the table is the location. So let's say that, uh, let's say on the break, uh, the, the cue ball has to be in the kitchen, okay? Well, if the cue ball has to be in the kitchen, all it means is where the ball is actually touching the felt, that part of the ball has to be in the kitchen. If it was over the line, it would be outside the kitchen. Likewise, object balls that are real close to that line, 
if if the if the if where they're resting is outside of the kitchen, it's outside. If where the ball is touching is inside the kitchen, it would be inside the kitchen. So so the, the rule I want you to understand is wherever the ball is actually touching the felt, physically touching the felt, is the true location of either your cue ball or an object ball. Uh, what I'm going to briefly do is show people how to rack a tight rack every time, okay? A lot of people, what they do is they just kind of roll the balls like that and they take the rack off and they don't really care what's loose or what's not. That's why a lot of racks, uh, you break them, you end up with a big cluster in the middle of the table, and it's because the, the rack was never tight to start with. What I want you to get in the habit of doing is go ahead and get your your head ball to where your head ball don't, don't roll. Okay, then what I want you to do is put your rack, these two contact points on both sides of that head ball. Then what I want you to do is I want you to roll it up. And if you'll notice, if you can do this without moving your rack, that you end up with a real tight rack, okay? So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna put the one where it goes. We're gonna uh, move the rack to where it's touching the one on both sides. And we're gonna rack and we have a tight rack, okay? Uh, likewise, we're just going to kinda get the ball where the, where the, the one don't move. Okay, we push all the balls up, you got a tight rack. So th th this is how I want you to get used to racking the balls. A lot of people, they just kind of roll them up there and they don't care if something rolls off or not. And sometimes I see people, they roll and roll and roll and then they push up. And every once in a while, sometimes you get lucky, but, but for the most part, I'll, I'll try to See how that rolls off and then they go like that. And, and this is gonna be one of those racks where you're gonna end up with a big cluster in the middle of the table and it's gonna take you forever to play the game. Okay, so basically just throw your, your one ball where it has a place to rest. Uh, take your rack and push it right up against the, the head ball. Push the rest of your rack up and that's a tight rack. Now I'm going to go over the proper racking of eight ball, okay? You know, uh, the, uh, the real rules state that you have to have the eight ball in the, in the center and you have to have a different ball in each corner, either a stripe or a solid or vice versa, okay? So these have to be different. One has to be a stripe, one has to be a solid, and your eight ball has to be here. Now, traditionally, traditional people over the years, you know, it don't matter which ball is on the, on the head one, uh, but these two are usually opposite. You know, one's a solid, one's a stripe. And so you go uh, stripe, solid, stripe, solid, and then solid, stripe, solid, stripe. That's going to still put you an opposite ball in each corner, and, and it's going to give you a little bit more... Uh, uh, when you break, you know, a lot of balls are going to be just all over the place. It's going to be a lot more random when you play, okay? So, with this being said, uh, it, 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 the, the, the rule of eight ball is the eight ball has to be here. These have to be opposite. If you want to rack the, the what I call the traditional way, which is every other ball, that's fine. But there's no rule that says you have to. So if you just throw your eight ball here and you make sure these corner balls are opposite of each other, if that's all you do, then you have done a legal rack uh, according to the rules. I'm gonna briefly uh, talk to you a little bit about breaking. Uh, the big problem that a lot of people have with breaking, you know, they take this big old honk and swing and they uh, all but miss cue on their cue ball. Sometimes they miss the rack completely. And uh, what they don't realize that breaking is more of an accuracy thing than it is a speed thing. Uh, let's just say that you're, you're shooting the ball from this direction. 
what you're wanting to do is you're gonna to wanna to aim your cue ball absolutely dead center on this head ball so that it's a flush hit, okay? Let's say you're shooting from the middle of the table, okay? Well then, let's say you're shooting from this, this angle, okay? You're gonna be shooting and making a flush hit on the, on the one. Let's say you're on this other side, okay? You're coming from this angle, okay? Uh, the, the, you're, you're, you're always, no matter what your angle is, you're wanting to make a flush hit on that head ball. If you have a tight rack and you make sure that you hit flush on a uh, dead center on that head ball, it, it don't take a lot of power to bust the rack out wide open and probably even make a ball in the break. But if you really try to get all erratic and you take a big old honking swing and you don't hit dead center on your cue ball and you get deflection or you don't hit uh, the, the, the head ball head on, it's probably going to go off the side and probably going to scratch or it's probably not going to even bust the balls out very far. So I want you, when you think about breaking, I want you to think of accuracy, accuracy, accuracy first. And then as you become accurate, then you can increase your speed. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, eight ball. I've, I've made it simple where I only have three stripes and three solids, but you know, uh, if you can imagine, you know, there's uh, balls all over the table after the break. Uh, after you break the balls, then the reason you don't have a group, let's say you make two stripes on the break, you don't have stripes. Uh, uh, be, and it's because there's a rule that has to be fulfilled for you to have a group. You have to make a call ball into a call pocket. Okay, so, so let's say that you break the balls and you make two stripes. Uh, you can shoot a, a strike ball in a pocket and then you have stripes from that point on. Or likewise, you can, uh, let's say you make two strikes in, in, on the break, uh, you can choose solids. And when you make a called solid ball into a called pocket, then you have solids for the remainder of the game. And now a lot of people played by rules years ago where, you know, if you make a ball on the break, then you have that group automatically. And, and those are really uh, bar rules and, uh, and, uh, and uh, kind of like straight ain't no slop. Uh, these are rules that a lot of people played under that weren't really the real rules of pool, okay? So just remember, after the break, no matter what goes in the pocket, you don't have any group. And what you're gonna do is you're, when you make a call ball into a pocket, you have that group. Let's say that you make a ball into a pocket and you scratch the cue ball off the table. Well, because you made the ball and you fouled, uh, then your opponent comes to the table and that person don't have a group either. And so, uh, but uh, that person does have ball in hand. So, so the thing of it is, is just remember, it, when somebody makes a legally called ball into a pocket without a scratch, then that person has that group of balls, okay? Now, you're gonna continue to play eight ball, and let's say that you have the stripes, okay? Well then, you know, once all of your stripes are pocketed, okay, then if you make the eight ball into a called pocket, then you're gonna win the game. Likewise, let's say that you, you have the solids, and you make all your solids off the table, and you're shooting, let's say, the eight ball into the corner pocket. These balls are already gone, so you, you make the eight into a call pocket, then that's how you win the game. Any time that you scratch while shooting the eight ball, you know, uh, any other fouls are just ball in hand. But let's say that you're, you're, you're the only ball on the table that's yours is the eight ball. All your other balls are gone. And you're trying to make the eight ball and you hit and you scratch the cue ball off the table. A, a cue ball goes into a pocket uh, or you, you make the eight ball into the wrong pocket. Like I'm, I'm trying to make the, uh, the, the eight ball here and it goes off a couple rails and goes in the side pocket. If this eight ball goes into a pocket, other than the pocket that I've called, then that's a foul, loss of game. Likewise, if the cue ball goes into a pocket, cue ball uh, scratches into a pocket uh, while I'm shooting the eight ball, then that is a loss of game. So that's really the only two ways you really lose the game other than your opponent shooting the eight ball off the table and winning the game against you, okay? Okay. Uh, 
Now, I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, three ball patterns. Uh, most people have a lot of trouble uh, playing pool or billiards because they, they just want to shoot a ball in the pocket, you know, and they have really not much regard for where their cue ball is going or what they're going to do next. Now, I've got this set up where we're going to shoot these in order. In eight ball, you could choose any ball that's yours. You could choose any stripe to shoot or any solid to shoot. But to make this demonstration, you know, really make more sense, we're going to say that we're going to shoot these balls in, in, in order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay? Now, at any given time, you're going to be within a three ball pattern, which means I'm going to shoot the, the, ball, the ball I'm shooting at to leave myself a shot on the next ball that will take me to my third ball. In this, in this example, I'm going to shoot the one, then I'm going to shoot the two and the three. That's my three ball pattern. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot the one and I'm going to stun off and I'm going to try to leave myself something fairly straight in on the two so I can easily leave myself the three. Okay? Let's say now my three ball pattern is I'm going to shoot the two, then I'm going to shoot the three to try to leave myself a shot on the four. Okay? So what I'm going to do is is probably hit the two and do a stop shot to leave myself the three. Okay, all right. So now I'm gonna shoot the three and I'm gonna leave myself a shot on the four that will that, 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 will, that will leave me a shot, a shot on the five. So the three, four, and five is my three ball pattern. Okay, so basically I'm gonna shoot a stop shot here and we'll say I make that ball. That leaves me a real easy shot on my four ball, which will take me to the five, which is a six. So my three ball pattern is the four to the five to the six, okay? So I'm gonna shoot this ball, make the four, maybe roll out a little bit for the five. Now my three ball pattern is I'm shooting, I'm, I'm shooting the five to leave myself an, an, an angle on the six that will take me to the seven, okay? so. I'm going to do a little stop shot on the five. I'll leave myself a shot on the six. Okay, so now my three ball pattern is going to be, I'm going to shoot the six. I'm going to roll up to somewhere past the, the side pocket to leave myself an easy shot on the seven that will take me to the eight. Okay, so let's say I shoot the six. I go in. I leave myself something like this. Okay, now I'm going to shoot the, the seven leave myself a shot on the eight, then will take me to the nine, okay? So I'm gonna shoot, maybe do a stop shot. Now, for the first time in this whole game, I don't have a three ball pattern, why? Because I don't have three balls left. Now I'm gonna shoot a shot on the eight to leave myself an easy shot on the nine. So let's say I shoot a shot on the eight, and let's say I hit the ball and I roll up, got myself an easy shot on the nine, and I shoot the nine, and I'm in the game, okay? All right. So, what you, so I want you to understand that when you're playing eight ball, at any given time, you're, you're, you're within a three ball pattern, okay? So we're gonna pull out, let's say, two, two stripes in the eight ball, so it makes sense, okay? So let's say that this is my scenario, okay? Uh, there's a lot of people especially if I line it up real easy, that would, would, that would probably shoot the four right in the pocket. And, 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 and then that they'd have an easy shot on the three, but there's a good chance they would not leave an easy shot on the eight ball. And so by you focusing on learning the game, shooting three ball patterns, you're gonna be a lot further ahead than people that don't realize this. So basically what I would probably do on this pattern is I would probably shoot the three, roll out somewhere around the middle of the table. Now when I shoot the four, I'm gonna leave myself a real easy shot on the eight, okay? Likewise, let's just say our eight's here, and let's say we have our four ball here, and we have, we have uh, let's say I have my four ball here, and I, I have my, my, my three here. Well then, a lot of people uh, would, would sit in, 
they would shoot maybe the, the easiest ball on the table. Maybe the easiest ball on the uh, table is the four ball. Okay, well they shoot the four and then they leave themselves a real hard shot on the three to get to the eight ball. Okay, so let, let's do, do this scenario. Let's say that this is my, this is, let's just say this is my, my, uh, my scenario. Uh, the three, the, the four, what I might do is I might shoot this three and I might go all the way up table like this. Now, when I hit the four, I, I may bounce all the way out to the middle of the table again to leave myself a shot on the eight ball. So what you're gonna have to do in learning this is you're gonna have to realize that you're gonna have to practice some of these three ball patterns you know, for it to make sense to you, okay? So let's say uh, uh, this scenario is, let's say I, I hit the four, I may go over here to the rail, I may leave myself a hard cut on the three to bring me back over here, okay? Well, what I might do, that's just as easy, is hit the three on the side and roll over here to where I have a real easy shot on the four. And then once I make the four, I come off the rail and leave myself something real easy on the eight ball. So what I'm saying is, is this is the three ball pattern, okay? So uh, how are we gonna practice this? How you're gonna practice this is, and, and I'm gonna explain this again in class, is you're gonna actually start trying to just throw three balls on the table and you're gonna try to run those balls. I don't care what pocket you make them in, you make them in any row, any order, it don't matter. Now, uh, the reason is you're gonna start recognizing that, that certain, certain shots go together or certain patterns go together. So uh, that's the only way to really learn the game. Most people learn the game by throwing a bunch of balls on the table or busting racks of eight ball and then sitting there and basically trying to make one ball at a time. You know, they, they make a ball, but then they leave themselves in Egypt uh, for their next shot. And so then they can't, don't make the next ball. And it goes back and forth and back and forth, and back and forth. And people get frustrated. So if you will take the time after our seminar to learn three ball patterns and practice three ball patterns, it's going to make you learning and progressing in the game of eight ball a lot easier. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a little bit of Q-tip maintenance, okay? Uh, most people, what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to uh, shape a cue. We're going to learn how to actually scuff a cue. And we're also going to learn how to chop the cue. Now, depending on the room that you're at, your HOA, depending on the quality of the sticks, um, uh, a lot of your sticks may not have a very good Q-tip on them. And if they're uh, not rounded and there's flat spots on them, it's gonna drastically re reduce your enjoyment, okay? All right, so to kind of give you an idea, there's many tools. This is a Willard scuffer. Uh, it has a round deal that is like the, the contour of a nickel. That's the little groove there. Uh, not that that's important. And how you would do this is you would sit there and you would rough and you would rotate your stick and rough and rotate your stick and rough. And when, when, when you get all done, it would be the contour of a nickel like that. It would be this contour and it tells you you have a perfectly rounded tip for a 13 millimeter. You know, there's uh, people that sometimes ask me, well, I got a, uh, a 12 millimeter shaft that's more of like a snooker shaft for a snooker. And, uh, and yeah, that's going to be the contour of a dime, not a nickel. Uh, likewise, after you do this, th these are originally were called tappers because people would go around and try to tap the, the top of their stick. But you, what you really want to do is just rotate, push and rotate, push and rotate, push and rotate. And, and you see how you're putting little, uh, little dents and stuff in, in, into that um, in, into that Q-tip and, and to see it makes it rough. But the beauty of this right here is it don't take leather off. You can do this a hundred times and you'll still have a Q-tip left. If you use a shaper or a scuffer, every time you're trying to scuff a stick, 
within a short period of time, you're gonna to have to re-tip your stick because you don't have any leather left. So this is just for shaping, and then this is really for scuffing. And, and I'll demonstrate this in class where it'll probably make a little bit more sense to you, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're briefly gonna go through proper chalking. A lot of people do not chalk very well. Some people don't chalk at all. I would say most beginners to low level players sometimes play an entire game and never chalk their stick. Or if they do, they just give it one of these little numbers and they think that's good. What I want you to get in the habit of doing, I'll try to turn it side, is I want you to start at the edge, start at the edge of your Q-tip and then bring your chalk toward the middle and rotate your Q-tip, your Q-shaft at the time. So you're pulling it toward the middle, rotate, pull it toward the middle, rotate, pull it toward the middle, rotate, pull it toward the middle, rotate. You see, when you do like that, you're, you're gonna end up with a perfectly chalked Q every time. So by starting on the edge, because most of your miscues is not because you don't have chalk in the middle of your Q-tip. It's because you don't have chalk on the very edge of your Q-tip. And if you don't have chalk on the very edge of this Q-tip and you're, you don't hit the cue ball uh, dead center, uh, then you're probably gonna miscue. And that's where a lot of miscues come from. Uh, uh, most miscues come from uh, basically Poor Q-tip maintenance, not keeping their stick scuffed. This, after a while, the, the leather will get really slick and it won't hold the chalk. Or they just don't chalk at all. So if you want to really enjoy this game to its highest level, you're going to need to, to basically chalk your, your Q-tip after every shot you shoot. It should be a habit. Um, sometimes when I teach students, uh, I, I put them through a test and sometimes they shoot six, seven, eight shots in a row and they never chalk their stick once. And uh, sometimes they miss cue during the test. And, and the reason for that is because they don't have, only chalk, they don't have no chalk on their Q-tip. Uh, the purpose of, of the chalk, by the way, is it creates friction between your cue ball and your Q-tip. Without the chalk, you would not have uh, that much friction between that leather and your uh, cue ball. So you wouldn't be able to to put the English or draw or follow or do a lot of the things that you're going to be able to do with that cue ball if you have no chalk on your stick. Uh, now what we're going to do is, is, is really just talk about the parts of the cue stick. You know, uh, naturally there's your cue tip. Uh, this cue tip should be rounded and it should be scuffed and chalked. Okay. Uh, behind your, your, the, uh, the cue tip is, is what we call a ferrule. Okay, the ferrule, you know, some of them are skinnier or longer, so there's different sizes. Uh, so, you know, the Q-tip, the ferrule. Now, if you have a two-piece Q where this one will break down into two pieces, the, the front part's called the shaft and the back part's going to be called the butt, okay? So, so just to kind of review, the Q-tip, ferrule, the shaft, and then your, uh, the butt itself. Now what we're going to do is, is kind of uh, go through how we're basically going to hold our stick. You know, you're going to have your, your uh, bridge hand, uh, you know, it's going to be holding your shaft. Uh, you're going to be skipping probably at least uh, maybe 8 to 10 inches between this hand and, and your uh, Q-tip. Uh, so uh, a lot of people choke up way and then they have no room to accelerate so they kind of throw their stick or po poke the ball. Uh, what we're going to have to do is, is get away from uh, the Q-tip quite a ways. Uh, this is something that's not very comfortable to people who have never really played much. It, your tendency is to get real close like this and, and to take these little jabby strokes, which will never enable you to ever play the game at a high level. Okay? So what we're going to do is this is going to be where we put our bridge. And now uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about where you put your back hand. Where you're going to be putting your back hand is going to be wherever you're holding it with this uh, middle finger and your elbow. Uh, that uh, middle finger and that elbow should be pointing straight down. There's a lot of people that do this, you know, they're, they're trying to poke it like that or they're, they're practically up here trying to, trying to poke it. But reality where you're going to hold your cue stick is going to be this middle finger 
and then it's going to be your elbow making about a 90 degree angle and that's going to be how you're going to hold the stick this is going to be your bridge and your rear hand is going to reflect uh, a straight up and down elbow to middle finger uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the one thing that a lot of people do wrong when they try to start learning how to play pool is they have a tight grip on their stick. Uh, why this is important is the fact that, that if you, let's say you're playing with a 19 ounce cue and you have a loose grip, it's a 19 ounce cue. But if you put your fingers around it, now it's a 21 ounce cue. If you tighten up a little bit, it's a 28 ounce cue. If you have a death grip on it, it's probably a 40 ounce cue. And you, you, so a lot of people never play the game very good because they, they, they feel like they need to have a death grip on this cue stick and nothing could be further from the truth. So what, how I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate a automatic grip. This is Johnny's automatic grip. I've taught this to over 500 players over the years and uh, most people just fall in love with it because it enables you to have a loose grip all the time. Okay. So I want you to get in the habit of of holding your, your stick with just your, your middle finger cup like that, see? Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to put this thumb on the side so these two fingers are touching. Now if you notice, there's a space above the stick. To kind of demonstrate this, I'm gonna put a block of chalk there, okay? So what it is, these two fingers are touching. They're not overlapping, that's what most people do wrong. They they grab a hold of the stick and then now they, they want to overlap these two fingers and now they still got a death grip on the stick even though they only have two fingers on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold this stick with these two fingers touching. Now if you notice there's a space there. Now I'm going to take my cue stick back and forward, back and forward. You see how it's not binding. It will never bind. Why? Because there is a space above the stick. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a death grip on this stick like most people have. I'm tightening up right there. You can see how wide it is. I can't even take my hand back because it's too rigid. And if I follow through, I must probably throw my stick up in the air and probably hit the light. Okay? This is what most people do. They get nervous and they want to grab a hold of the stick at like this and they want to, you know, they and and that's one reason that they, they poke at the ball because they don't have enough fluidity uh, to be able to take the cue stick back. See, I'm already binding here with maybe about a two or three inch backstroke. But you see, that's why you have to have a loose grip. Uh, having your fingers around the stick will never be correct. And the sooner that you get away from having your, your, all your fingers around this stick and you start holding it with your middle finger with your thumb on the side, that's when you're gonna start learning how to, how to hold the stick properly and how to have a loose grip, and you're gonna be able to play some pull. Uh, a lot of people, they ask me about stances, you know, and because a lot of you are, you know, just getting started with the game, uh, there's a lot of misconception about stances, and uh, there's a lot of people that if they don't get, if you don't get your body on a really good line with the shot, then your your body will never ever be able to do the shot properly. You know the rest of your your elbow, your arm, and everything will not be lined up with the shot. And then what's going to happen as you fall through your your cue stick is going to go all over the place because your body is not properly aligned. Okay, so what I want you to imagine. And, and I'm leaving this on, on the table as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a guide, okay? So that's your shot line. Like, I, let's say I'm shooting the eight ball in the corner pocket right here. This is the shot line. This is the line that my cue stick's gonna travel in order to deliver my cue, cue, ball, cue, cue ball to that eight ball in the proper spot, okay? Now keep in mind, if my aim changes, then my shot line changes, you see? You know, so if I was aiming, uh, let's say I was trying to, you know, do a cut shot or something like that, I may be over here. This becomes my new shot line. Your shot line is exactly where you're going to be shooting your cue ball. Okay, so so the, the, so I want you to think about that. So let's say I'm going to shoot my cue ball in, in this direction to make the eight. This becomes my shot line. 
What I want to start out is I want to start out by putting my halfway between my ankle and my toes. It could be your toes or it could be your ankle, but it needs to be some part of the front part of your foot. I want you to put that on that imaginary line. So you see how this line will extend out indefinitely. What I want to do is I want to put my foot on that line. Now this front foot is, is individuality. You know, where, where you're putting your front foot, I'm not as concerned about as you getting your back foot on that line, okay? Now, what I will do is I'll put my back foot on the line and I'll just move this out for the, for the time being. Okay, so now I'm all lined up to shoot the eight. And if I look back, the, this, this part of my stick is directly over the top of my foot. So, so with every shot I shoot, I want to make sure that I get that part of my foot on this imaginary line. If I don't, I'm going to intentionally step away from the line. You see, now my stick is nowhere close to where it needs to be. My pendulum is not going to be where it should be. My elbow is not going to be where it's going to be. And so for every other shot, if this foot is going all over the place, instead, instead of being on the line, maybe I've, I've overshot it or I've undershot it, or I'm like this, this is where people end up shooting shots like this with a stick nowhere close to their body because they put their foot down and instead of adjusting their feet before they shoot, what they do is they put their foot down and then they try to align everything else up without readjusting their feet before they shoot. So what I want you to do is imagine your shot line, put your foot on that line, and then go down. And you're gonna find, after a while, you'll figure out where your front foot needs to be for you. Because some people put their front foot at different uh, places that feels comfortable to them. An example, let's say that you're a guy, uh, there may be a certain stance that's more uh, comfortable to you, and let's say that you're a, a woman, there may be another stance that might be more comfortable for you. So therefore, each individual is gonna to have to figure out where to put the front foot, but the back foot needs to be on the line or on your shooting line. Okay, anytime you're doing a bridge, you know, uh, what I want you to get in the habit of doing is when you, you, you before you shoot, you should be pu pushing down the heel of your hand down to the felt with a force of about three pounds. So let's say that I'm getting ready to shoot the eight ball and I'm all done aiming. Now I'm gonna push down with a force of about three pounds so that this bridge can't go nowhere. So by pushing down with the heel of your hand, that's what's gonna set the bridge and it's gonna make your bridge solid. Okay, so your, your bridge is not gonna be moving during your shot. So uh, well, after you're done aiming, you got everything the way you want to, I want you to push this heel down to, to the felt so it can't go nowhere. Okay, now uh, the, the, the biggest problem that most people have when they first get started is it's real hard for them to make a bridge, okay? So we're gonna first start with the open bridge, okay? The open bridge is going, and I'll try to do it kind of towards you, is you're gonna to try to make a, uh, a, v, a V between this finger and this knuckle. See, so if I take it away, see how I put this thumb against the, this finger and it makes a little V for my, for my stick to, to ride in, okay? One more time, okay? Now you're gonna spread your fingers and how you're gonna raise this up is you're going to either pull those fingers in or spread those fingers to ra raise and lower your, your, your bridge, okay? So this is what we call the open bridge, okay? Now, for the closed bridge, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out by putting these two fingers together. We're not gonna overlap them. We're gonna put these two together, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make kind of like an okay sign, okay? I'm going to put these two fingers together. Now, you notice that my middle finger is, is, is kind of underneath my, 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 uh, my Q shaft at a little bit of an angle, 
you know, I can even dramatize that by turning it a little bit more, okay? But by these two fingers being touching, you notice that it's not very, uh, it's not very secure, you know? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slowly turn this wrist to where this little groove between where my thumb is, that groove, is gonna be where my guide of my stick truly is, okay? So I'm gonna to touch these two fingers together with my middle finger underneath, and I'm gonna slowly rotate my hand until this part of my hand touches, you know? This part of my hand is touching, okay? And when I do that, see how easy that is? It's not binding, and it, and it gives you a really, really good bridge. Likewise, the same as the other one, what you're gonna do is you to raise it, you're gonna move your fingers in, and to lower it, you're gonna spread your fingers out. Now this is the closed bridge. What most people do is they either over rotate and put a bind on it, or they start overlapping these two fingers. You know, they start trying to overlap like this, and now it's all binding, and they can't hardly move the stick. So, so you need to remember, only touch these two fingertips together and see how loose it is? And then slowly rotate your hand until that, this, uh, uh, this, this edge of, of your hand becomes your guide. And you can see how easy that is going in and out, uh, even without a glove. Okay, the next bridge we're gonna cover is going to be something called a rail bridge. And so uh, I'm gonna demonstrate this to the side where it makes more sense to you. But let's say that your cue is real close to your rail and you don't have a room to put your hand. Most people, they start trying to do this on the rail and then they end up having an elevated cue and they can't play. You know, they, they start trying to put the, the regular bridge that's on the table on top of the table and now this is the shot that they're shooting. You can see it, your, your stick's way up in the air and you're not going to be able to shoot very good shots like that. Okay, so how you're going to do this is I'm going to go straight at you. I want you to line up your middle finger. I want you to tuck this thumb in. See how that thumb and that middle finger make a line? Okay, so the, a lot of people try to put the thumb over the top or this finger over the top or this right here, they're, they're trying all kind of stuff. But what I want you to do is I want you to put your thumb and that middle finger together to where those two make a line. Now I want you to take your other finger over the top. Now this finger here is just pulling it over because your middle finger and this thumb, that is your guide. So I'll turn it a little bit to the side. See how that, that middle finger and that thumb is my guide. This finger here is just to hold the stick over to that, those two fingers. Now this is a rail bridge, so I'm just gonna do it by the numbers. Most people have trouble doing this because they try, they, they're used to trying to wrapping their hand around the stick somehow or another. Well, it's called a rail bridge because your cue stick is gonna be, touch, is gonna be on the rail. Okay, so what we're gonna do is start with the, the thumb and the middle finger, we're gonna slide our stick over there, we're gonna put it right there, and then that's the closed bridge. But so if, if, if you start your bridge and, and this cue is not on the table, you already know you're doing it wrong, okay? So basically straight at you. These two fingers form a straight line. You put your cue stick next to it. Right there is the rail bridge, okay? Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take you through what we call the tripod bridge. This is the most difficult bridge uh, for all players, uh, not just beginners. And so, uh, it, but I do think it's a bridge you need to work on and you need to be able to master because otherwise you're not gonna really be able to shoot over the top of a ball. And that's gonna, you're gonna run into that uh, uh, quite often, okay? So how we're gonna do this, I'm gonna go straight at you what I'm gonna start out is by putting my fingers on the table and I'm gonna have my thumb up in the air and I'm gonna to try to hook it, you know, just so the, the, the cue stick won't fly away. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this part of my stick into my 
body. It could be, you know, your chest or whatever, whatever part of your body that it, it touches. Okay, so, well, let's say I was shooting the eight ball over the top of the nine. What I want to do is I want to use this part of my body and, and hooking uh, my finger. And you see how between my body and my finger, it becomes a straight line. Now, you're going to notice that even though I have a loose grip, that my pendulum is not going to be straight up and down like it normally would be. It's going to be more sideways, okay? You can still have a pendulum, but what I'm saying is, but the, the main thing on, on, on shots like this is keep it simple. A lot of people, they, they get jacked up over a ball, and then they take a big old honk and swing, and usually they miss cue. They usually miss the ball they're shooting at, and nothing good happens, okay? Uh, so when you're jacked up over a ball, let's say I'm shooting the eight ball over the top of the nine, I want you to, to keep your stroke as simple as possible. Uh, you can maybe only draw it back maybe two or three inches is fine. Just straight back, straight forward, straight back, straight forward. So let's say I was shooting this eight ball in a real game situation. What I would probably do is I'd probably take it back about two or three inches and shoot. Two or three inches and then shoot. And the reason is, is I want to keep this stroke as simple as I possibly can. Now I'm using my thumb to hold it in and I'm using my body as a guide. So that's the tripod bridge. It's going to take a little bit of practice to get used to, but it is something you're going to need to learn because if you don't learn it, uh, you're going to run into a lot of situations where you're going to have trouble shooting over the top of a ball. Now I'm going to briefly take you through uh, one of the most basic aiming systems. It's called the ghost ball. What I want you to think about is this ball right here does not exist. It's an imaginary ball, this ball right here. Now what, what it is, if, if you make contact with this eight ball, at that point where those two balls meet, you're going to make the ball, okay? So to kind of give you an idea, this ball does not exist. This is not a cue ball, this is an imaginary ball, okay? Okay, so this is the imaginary place that you want your cue ball to end up with to make the eight. That's why they call it the ghost ball method, okay? Now, keep in mind, you can have a straight in shot, but your cue ball can come from any different directions. There's mainly six uh, 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 shooting positions for the cue ball, okay? But each time you're shooting, you're going to try to replace this ball with, with your cue ball. So to kind of give you an idea, if you're hitting straight ahead, you'll replace it. But now let's say that you're shooting from where the six is, you see how the six is going to come along and it's going to hit at that spot, okay? So each one of these cue ball positions is going to take the place of this imaginary cue ball. And so how I used to teach people, uh, and I think it's an easy way to learn, is if you have somebody that can help you, okay, then what you can do is, 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 is line up the shot for, let's say, a pocket, and have your, your, the student actually aim, or the person you're playing with aim, directly where this imaginary ball is, okay? And then what you do is you take it away and then you have them shoot the ball. So then you go to the next ball, you line it up to where if they hit it, they would make it, okay? And then you have them aim, aim the shot at this imaginary ball, and then right before they shoot, you take it away. This is a, a very simple way to, to learn aiming, and after a while, when you take the ball away, you're gonna realize that these different shots don't look the same because your cue ball is coming from a different spot. Uh, the hardest part is that people want to aim to wherever their contact point is. Let's just say uh, uh, if you draw a line between the eight ball through the ball, then you'd say that this is my this is my contact point. Well, a lot of people what they do is they they try to aim the the cue ball at their contact point. So let's say that, you know, I'm aiming my cue ball at the at contact point. Well, if I aim the six, you'd see I'd 
drastically overcut the ball. So you're not really aiming the cue ball at your contact point. And so I believe the easiest way for people to learn how to pocket balls is to use a, a, a object ball as their ghost ball, line it up to the pocket, have them aim it, then take the ball away, and then have them take a look at it before they shoot it. And I, I've taught this to a lot of players over the years, and I think this is one of the easiest methods there is to learning how to pocket a ball. Uh, what I'm gonna go over now is something that I think every player needs to know. Uh, not just uh, beginners or people that are new to the, to the game, but every player. Um, uh, an example, let's say that you've aimed the ball perfectly and you've stroked your cue stick perfectly. You know, you've shot it perfectly, you've aimed it perfectly, and you still may have missed the ball. Uh, that's the scenario that a lot of players uh, are in. Now, without the knowledge of collision-induced throw or contact-induced throw, then what you're going to end up doing is changing your aim or maybe changing your stroke when there was nothing wrong with your aim or stroke to start with because you just didn't understand uh, collision and stroke. So what we're going to briefly do is briefly go over this, okay? I, I want to you know, imagine that you're aiming the eight ball straight into the corner pocket. This is your cue ball, the white ball. This is your eight ball straight in the pocket. And where you're aiming it is in the middle of the pocket, okay? Okay, when you have a straight in shot, you have no collision and stroke. So you just aim the, 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 uh, the eight ball directly into the pocket, no problem. Okay, now let's say that your cue ball is not coming straight in. Let's say it's coming from one side or the other. That is where collision induced throw comes into play. Okay, so let's just say that every ball is going to contact exactly where it needs to contact. So we'll put a ghost ball in there and we'll line it up perfectly for the three. So it don't matter if it's the white ball, the one or the two, wherever the cue ball is, it's gonna make a perfect contact directly in the middle of this pocket, okay? Okay, so let's say I'm coming uh, straight ahead, I just aimed in the middle of the pocket, I make the ball. If I'm coming from the one, then I'm gonna shove this object ball offline, okay? Because as the one contacts the eight, it shoves it over because it's coming from this direction, okay? It's going to shove it over about a half a ball. So let's just say this is the center of my ball, this is my aim point, and I move it over a half a ball. That means that the pocket I'm putting this in is almost just wide enough for, for the object ball to go in. Okay? Likewise, we'll put it dead center. Now I'm coming from the two ball. Okay? So I'm going to shove my object ball this direction. Okay? So I'm going to put my finger dead center. I'm gonna move it over a half a ball, and you can see I barely have enough room for the object ball to go into the pocket, okay? Okay, so uh, where this comes into play is what I want you to do when you're playing in a, is imagine a straight line going directly from your, your object ball to your pocket. Now I want you to look at, at if your cue ball is relatively straight in, just aim it straight to the pocket, no problem. But if your cue ball is on this side, what I want you to do is instead of aiming dead center, I want you to aim where the nine ball is, about a half a ball outside the pocket. So that means your eight, your eight ball is gonna be aiming here. It's, you're gonna be aiming about a half a ball outside the pocket or the, or the, edge, or the middle of the ball to the, to the tit, okay? Okay, so now we're going to do the same scenario, okay? Uh, I'm going to get a half a ball collision induced throw, okay? Now I'm in the pocket, but look at how much pocket I have left over, okay? Okay, so now we'll put this ball here. Now I say I'm coming from the two, and I do this just to color code it where it kind of makes more sense, okay? You're going to hit the two, you're going to shove it over, okay? So I'm right here, dead center. I move it over about a half a ball, the ball goes in, but look at how much pocket I have left over. So by understanding collision induced throw and, 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 and to start allowing for it, what you're going to end up doing is over doubling the size of the pockets on the table. Because if you, no matter where your cue ball is coming from, if you're always aiming 
dead center to the middle of the pocket, you're going to miss a lot of shots. Okay. Now I, I just want to leave, leave you a thought. Okay. Like if, if, if you're shooting from the two, you would aim at the 10. If you were shooting from the one, you'd aim at the nine. And there's a very simple formula for this is if, if you draw a line straight in the pocket, right? Then what you're going to do is just pay attention to what side is your cue ball. Your cue ball, if you're the one, is on this side. You would just aim to the same side that your cue ball is on, right? Let's say my two, my cue ball is the two. It's on this side. So you just aim to the same side of the pocket that your cue ball is on. So if your cue ball is on this side, you aim to this side. If your cue ball is on this side, you aim to this side. And so that's how you can easily uh, apply this in a real game situation. So next time that you're, 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 uh, you're, you're kind of cutting the ball, especially about a half a ball hit, and, and you notice that you didn't make the ball, don't automatically think you, 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 you didn't uh, aim it right or you didn't um, stroke it right. If you didn't over aim that pocket, you know, a half a ball or maybe more if it's further away from the pocket, then you may have stroked it perfectly. You may have aimed it perfectly, but you, miss, you missed the shot because you did not allow for a collision induced threat. I'm going to uh, uh, teach you a little bit about the tangent line. Uh, most players really don't understand it. And uh, sometimes they'll hit a ball and they have no idea where their cue ball is going after that. I can't tell you how many times I watched somebody shoot a very simple shot, let's say in the side pocket, and, and uh, the tangent line is going right for the pocket. They just make the ball on the side and they just roll right into the corner pocket. And they had no earthly idea that that's what was going to happen. Okay, so what I want you to imagine is when these two balls touch, there's a 90 degree angle where they touch. Okay, we'll kind of put a piece of paper where you can see that. So let's say that as you, ch as you change this contact point, you can see your tangent line is going to change. Okay, okay, but wherever these two balls touch at that moment of contact, that's going to be your tangent line. Give you some idea. Let's say I'm I'm shooting the four. Uh, let's say I'm going to shoot the four into uh, the corner pocket. Okay. And let's say I'm shooting from this direction. Well, I'm going to make the four, but I'm going to roll forward and hit the six. But let's say that I'm shooting from this direction. Well, then I'm going to make the four, and I'm going to come over here and bust the eight and the eleven up. Okay. Another thing that you can do too is let's say I'm making the four. From here, then technically, if I hit right here, you can see where where the, this cue ball is going to go toward the corner pocket up there by where the camera is. So, by understanding this, what I want you to get used to is when you're pocketing a ball, like let's we'll say the four in the corner. Well then, what I want you to do is, is just briefly take a moment and look at the 90 degree angle that's formed at that contact point, and that's going to tell you where your cue ball is going to go. It could go this direction or it could go this direction depending on what side. Now, the more straight in you are, it's not going to go, to, it might go slightly to one side or the other, but, 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 but the more you get an angle and you cut, then that's going to be what your ain't what your your tangent line is going to do okay so i hope this makes a little bit of sense it, uh, by looking at that 90 degree angle at the moment of contact between those two balls that's going to tell you where your cue ball is going to uh, going to be going to at the moment of contact